please have your name? Maria de Matestok. Where were you born? I was born in Warsaw, Poland. When were you born? 1935, August the 3rd. Felix, can I have your full name, please? My full name? 735-3712. That was your full name. Not your phone number. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Phone name, name please. Thank you. When you get old, you have a hard time to hear me sometimes. You speak up and go down. Well, my full name is Felix Matistro. Okay. Where were you born? Born in Poland, a little place called Rimacze. Where is Rimacze? Rimacze. Well, it's an Eastern Poland. Eastern Poland? Eastern Poland. Used to be. Used to be Eastern Poland. All right now it's under Ukraine. Okay. So when were you born? October 29, 1928. Maria, what was the name of your parents? My parents were Stanisław and Janina Dymek. Uh, they were born in, my father was born in 1887, 93. 93, yes, 1893. My mother was born in 1900. Um, they were very wealthy people. They were millionaires in Poland. My mother comes from a, a family that is very well known as, as far as Poland is concerned. She was from a royal family. She was, uh, let's say, five, six removed from the queen. Uh, my father was a businessman. They owned a factory in, in Warsaw in, in 1920, 1918, 1920. He uh, had a factory, furniture factory, that, that, that employed about 128 people. At that time, in, in this era, that's a big factory. That's a very fat, very big factory. Anyway, they were healthy, wealthy. We were happy till 1939. 1939 in September when the war started. Before the war started, as a matter of fact, it, it was already. It was already. We know. My parents knew. I was. What was I? I was born 1935, so I was. Maybe four. Yeah, four years old. Four, yes. But my parents knew that the war was coming. And because of my, my father's uh, uh, status that he had in Poland, in Warsaw, uh, he was trustworthy. And they chose him as one of the members that would go to England and take the uh, Polish uh, national, treasure. national treasure into England to so the Germans wouldn't get a hold of it. And when uh, he left, he was coming back. They delivered the, the goods there. And, and when he was coming back, he was caught by the Germans and put into a camp. It was, uh, I presume, I don't know exactly what camp it was. It was a, 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 a prison camp of, of soldiers, or it was just a camp of people that they happened, didn't like. Anyway, he ended up in, in that camp, and we lost track of him completely. We did not know where he was, if he was dead, if he, came back, if he comes back, he, if we ever see him again, never. So uh, he left my mother with five children. I was four. My, I was the youngest of the family. My brother was at least at that time. He was born 1922, so he was... Uh, 18, 17, 18, something like that, teenager. And then my sister was a year and a half younger than him, and then another sister two years younger than him, and then there was a little break in the family, and there's my Christina is born 1934, and uh, we stayed home, and we waited for dad to come. Being wealthy, at first it was all right because uh, we, my father left us all the food and all the, 
you know, like uh, corn and, and, and uh, kasha and rice and everything, bags to, to keep us going till he come back. Well, when he never came back, my mother started selling her jewelry, crystal, all the riches that they had. And uh, that's how we continued. Even though we had an apartment building with about, I'd say about 20 apartments, but nobody could pay any rent because it was war. You couldn't collect any money. So we just had to live on what she could gather. And it was going from bad to worse. Then in 1944, the Warsaw Uprising started. Well, all of my, my brother and my sisters were in the up, underground, even my mother as well, except for Christina and I, who were the youngest one. <laughs> we had to stay home. And, uh, and by the way, I never went to school in Poland. The reason why we didn't go to school, my mother didn't send us to Poland uh, to school because uh, the Germans used to surround the kindergarten and grade one. All the children that had blonde eyes, blonde uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, and they used to pack them up on one of the army trucks and take them into Germany and disperse them into uh, German families. They wanted completely extinguished all the Polish nationality. And they tried to get all the nice, young, healthy, because we, we were good-looking kids, you know, and nice, nice-looking and healthy and everything. And they wanted to get these to, to Germanize us. And my mom was afraid to lose us. So we never, she never sent us to school. And um, then when the Warsaw Uprising started, it was horrible. That was that was something that it, it's very difficult to even explain and get into it. There were bombs. There were shooting. There were there were fire all over all around. I mean, I'm I'm shortening the the, the war because I couldn't possibly tell you everything what was going on, but. Number one, my sisters and my brother, they used to bring all kinds of ammunition, guns, revolvers, and, and uh, they used to bring it into the house, smuggle it in, and we did not know where to hide them. Was that part of the underground? Oh, yes. That part of? Yes. So they, they would smuggle weapons? They would, they would smuggle weapons to, to, to disperse them afterwards to all the rest of the people. And because we had a big house, and it was a big apartment, a garden, and in the garden we had a, it's not a chicken coop, but it was like a, my father had a white pigeons. pigeons. And uh, he used to have them pigeons in, in, that, in that building, and in, over there there was a big chimney. And they used to hide all the guns and ammunition, everything in the chimney hanging it, you know, with the wires and things like that. Well, the reason they did that is because in the house, I mean, there was no such thing as restriction. I mean, they, they came in, they want to go through your house, and they went through your house. They just, if you didn't open the door, they just knock it open or throw a grenade in there. And that, that, that was the, how do I call it, what kind of a key? Master. Master key. <clears throat> you know, the grenade. <laughs> so we better, <laughs> we better open the door. And uh, oh, I was always scared. It was, I was always living in fear. Anyway, uh, so when they used to come in to the house, they used, they used to go, and the whole house was just in the uproar. They went in. I mean, if you if you see any burglary right now, anywhere, it was close, and even more because they used to knock the walls down just be, between. The walls, they were afraid that if there was an empty spot in the wall, that they would knock it down because they'd think that we had uh, uh, ammunition or guns or whatever stashed over there. And uh, where, where, where am I going now? Um, the last few days of, of the 
beginning of the uprising. Now everybody was supposed to go to their to their stations, like everybody belonged to a different group of, of these underground places. And uh, so my mother left, and my sister left, and my brother left, and my other sister left, and they were all teenagers. My, my, the one, the Yolanta, the one, she was uh, 16, 15, 17, something like that. Yeah. And she went. And Christina and I were left alone. Now, I was nine, and she was ten. We were left alone in the house. And we did not know what to do. So we kind of cuddled in the bed, covered ourselves up, and just sat there and cried. Didn't know what to do. So I very strongly believe, and as a matter of fact, you have to know that Poland 99% of Polish people are Roman Catholic. Our religion meant a lot to us. It, more, it was, we, we could le lose our freedom, we could lose our homes, we could lose our country, but that's one thing people would no, never lose. It's their Roman Catholic beliefs and, and, and trust in God. So Christina and I, we sat there and we cried and afraid, of course. Lo and behold, my mother came back. She couldn't possibly go because the Germans were, you know, they had their posts all over the city. I mean, there's their machine guns and soldiers, and, and she couldn't get through to her post, post that, that she was supposed to go to. And neither could Yolanda. Those two came back. But Donna and Stanislav they made it and they were there, so we lost track of them completely. I mean, we did not know where they were, what they were doing, if they were alive, dead. And uh, the bombs were falling. The, the building that was across our garden, it was a, a, a soap factory. They started burning. And of course, you know, with the with the soap materials, it's grease and things, and it was terribly, awfully terribly burning. It was just horrible to the point that our our house starting to catch on fire. I'll never forget that. Uh, my mother, as a matter of fact, I forgot one thing. I forgot that my mother, before we left, she buried a lot of things in the garden under the patio, crystal, gold, diamonds, all the things that she thought if we come back she'd dig it up and we'll continue living on it, whatever. And my father's violin. My father was a violinist. He was studying in Petersburg, before the war, of course, with uh, Rubinstein. Our, our Rubinstein, our pianist, they were buddies. They were, he was, uh, Rubinstein was a pianist and my father was a violinist. And uh, that's what saved his life, if I can come back to it. When he was caught and uh, brought to the camp, prison camp, uh, they were there, and at night time there was one soldier coming in what, it, to his post. Guards. It's a, like a guard, and uh, he used to bring his violin. And he used to start, you know, playing the violin. It just didn't sound good because he didn't know how to play. He knew how to hold it, but he wasn't a violinist. And my father, at first, he was afraid because he did not know if he should approach this man or not. But one time, after a few months. <laughs> he had enough courage to go up to him and ask him if he could only hold the violin in his hands. And he says, you're a violinist? He says, yes. Oh, he says, will you teach me how to play? And he says, well, if I can. All right, he says, we'll make a deal. You teach me how to play, and I'll smuggle your food so you can, you know, not be going to be hungry and starving. And that's how he lived through. But when he got that violin and he put it in his hand and started playing, the German guard 
he melted. You know, because my father played music. He concertized through Germany, France, Russia, Poland, Hungary. He was just a beautiful, absolutely beautiful violinist. And uh, my father's brother was also a musician, and he was a conductor of the uh, Warsaw Opera Company Symphony. So it, it was music all around. My, my mother's parents, my mother, uh, my mother's mother and father, were both singing in the opera company in Warsaw, in the, in the opera company there. And that's where they met. That's where they married, met, and that's how their family was living. Music all around. Anyway, so my father saved his life by uh, playing the violin and teaching that man. I don't know how much he learned, but he was teaching a few months because the war lasted for a few more years. A few more years. And uh, now I'm coming back leaving my father, how he saved his life, coming back when the fire, the fire was all over fire. So my mother and my sister Yolanta and Christina and I, we packed up one suitcase, one pillow, and one, how do you call it, a, a pudra, um, Some kind of blanket. Some blanket, it's like a comforter there. And uh, we had to run away from our home because he was starting to catch on fire. Uh, so we went. It was like a, our back, back, backyard, the garden, where the fire was on. There was our building here, and there was another front yard, which was, it wasn't fence, it was like a brick, Wall. A stone wall? Wall, yes, with a big, huge, big gate. I mean, through that gate you can come with the car, with a, with a truck. It was one of these big gates, you know, with uh, iron, you know, the iron, how do you call it? Iron, yeah. iron rod gate. Iron rod gate, yes. Anyway, we stood there in front of that gate. Uh, this was the, there was the, there was a the gate. We had to come across to go across the street. Over at this end of the block, at this end of the block, there was machine guns all set up. And there were people running away, of course, running away from, from here because it was burning and we were going. There's a lot of people going. There were machine guns just shooting, bullets flying, you know, people falling, dying, being killed. My mother grabbed my sister Yolanta. And she says to her, says, Yolanta, I, you have to come across first. And uh, then I'll send Christina, and then Maria will go after the last, and I, I will go at last, the last one. If by any chance I couldn't make it, or they'd kill me, take care of your sisters. And uh, what she was doing is, Grab, took my sister's forehead, made a sign of the cross, kissed her, and uh, my sister ran across. Sorry. There was Christina afterwards, the same, the same situation. And me, and when I came, I, I ran across, I remember I was tripping, I was tripping over the stones, over the, over the bricks, over the dead bodies. And, and, and I was running and I was running, finally I came across. When I came across, I turned around and started, started crying. Mama, mama, mama. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Anyway, my mom came. My mom ran across and she came and we got together and we started traveling through the wreckage because everything was bombed. If you've seen any of these, uh, any of these uh, pictures from Warsaw, the friends of the, the pianist, that was, uh, that was the place that we were, we were in. 
and uh, through the tunnels, through buildings, other buildings, and I was holding on to my sister Yolanta because Chris was holding on to my mother. And we were, we were running, and finally we got to some kind of a building. It was like a factory. It was a, a huge place. It was maybe 10 times as big as this classroom. And there was a lot of people there, a lot of people. Uh, everybody just got together. And they didn't know where to move. They didn't know where to go anymore. So the nightfall came, and we all fell asleep on the ground. My mother had that pillow, you know, and, and comforter, so we were lucky. We slept, we fell down. About four o'clock in the morning, my sister Yolanta woke up. She says, Mama, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Mom, let's get out of here. My mother woke up. We woke up. She's putting all these things together, shoves us off from the pillows and the stuff, packing them all together, that suitcase and everything. She says, let's get out. Let's get out. My mother says, child, where are we going to go? We have no place to go. Let's get out of here. Sure enough, we just got out of there. Just get out of there. Maybe 20 feet, the Germans opened up four doors, grenades. Everybody was killed there. Everybody was killed. Yes, I was meant to live in my family, too. My mom lived until she was 97. Bless her heart. Anyway, so, and then afterwards we saw another building, but then what we, what we saw, what happened to that building there where they put the grenades, we didn't want to go inside the building anymore. And my mom says, we're going to get caught by the Germans anyway, so let's stand outside. At least we'll, they'll see that we're women, children. So uh, we did. And that's when we got caught and put into a bunch of thousands, 10,000 people, 9,000 people, a lot of people, a lot of people. And they were, they were leading us, of course, through the streets, <coughs> through all the wreckage, one side, this side burning. It was, everything was on fire. Everything was on fire. Hi, Jean. How are you, sweetheart? Uh, I was scared. I really was scared. Uh, hold on to my sister. My uh, my mother always dressed us a lot uh, uh, same. My Christina and I were always dressed the same because we were approximately the same size. So we had the same coats, the same dresses, the same bows on the head, the same shoes, just like twins. The reason why. Between Yolanta and Christina, you can see there's a lot of room. There were a pair of twins that were born, but unfortunately they died at birth. So, And she always felt that we were her twins. Well, it wasn't true because it was a year and a half difference, but she dressed us the same. The reason I'm telling you why is because when they were leading us uh, into the, into the uh, church, which was desecrated. Machine guns run through the whole church. The the, the statues had no head, no no. The, everything was the Christ. The cross was on top of the ground. The everything was just desecrated. And they shoved us in there and told us to stay there. Kept us there for a couple of days. I mean, there was no washroom. There was no water. Uh, we used to go into a behind the altar somewhere, into the sacristy over there to, to go to the bathroom. It was just horrible. It was just terrible. It, it was just scary, fear of death, hungry. I started getting fleas and, and lies in my body, in my clothes. So did my sister Christina. And then uh, they kept us there for a couple of days, two, three days. And uh, then they let us in, and uh, in a group, and towards the train station. 
over there they had to divide the people because an old lady or an old man, young kids of eight, seven, five, or infants, they were no use to them. They would just cause a lot of expense because they would have to feed them and stuff. So what they did is they were, they were dividing us. Uh, for instance, girls of 16 and up this way, women, older women, let's say from 30 on to 50 this way, same thing with men, the same with women, and us with small little children and old women and old men over here somehow. And they were all divided with the uh, wire. Barbed wire. Fenced in. <coughs> Fenced in. And uh, why, how, we, how we ended up together with my sister Yolanta being 16 is that uh, when, when she saw what was happening, she grabbed me, turned my coat inside out so it wouldn't be the same color, the same as my sister Christina. And she put a babushka on her head. You know what babushka? It's kerchief. Yeah. And and she took some earth from from the ground and dirtied up her face so she wouldn't look as young as she was. And then she pulled me about ten people behind. So when they were separating, it was those were fast. You know, woman with a child this way, uh, this one this way. So a woman with a child this way. And when Yolanta came up, we went to the same group as the Your women mother. with my mother was, and with old women, old men, and all these people. And then afterwards, my sister went around Yolanta, of course, I'm talking, because us two girls were just hugging. My mother was afraid we didn't want to move one inch. And uh, she went around, all around that barbed wire to see what was going on. And she saw, she realized that we were in the group that all the women and men were old and women with children. Oh, she said, that's no good. That's no good. That's something wrong here. So she came back to my mother again and said, Mama, let's go. My mother says, what, again? Mama, let's go. Somehow, in the middle of the night, she took the barbed wire she pressed her swift foot, left it up. We all went into the group of the young people that were there, which were going for hard labor into Germany. These people were going for an execution. So we went there with those with that group, and. Uh, they piled us into a, one of these kettle cars, the, the train. It was packed. I mean, if you, you didn't dare lift up one foot and relax for a while because you wouldn't have room to put it back, that's how they packed us. I mean, there was no way you could move. I was little, so I couldn't breathe because everybody was, you know, like you, you put a clothing in, in, in you, you have a coat or, or, or somebody in front of you and they, they press against your face, they, they ch choke you. So Yolanta again had to lift me <laughs> and hold me up in her arms so I wouldn't I'd get killed. So as my mom did with Christina, the same thing. Anyway, they, 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 they uh, put us into, and they, we went for, I don't know for how long, I can't tell you, that, 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 that is, Beyond me, I don't know how long we traveled. To, to me, it seems like it was a lifetime. Anyway, so. Kara Bushy, would you meet your mother? We um, went there. Near the and main uh, office. They Kara Bushy, out, near the main office. Of course, to go. And everybody just went under the cars, on, behind the cars. The, nobody, the kids didn't care where, right in front of the soldier. We just had to empty ourselves somehow. And then afterwards, they, they came up with a truck load of bread, big, big loaves of bread, about that big. And they did not 
give to everybody because I guess they didn't have every, uh, enough for everybody. So what they did, they opened up the back of the truck and they just threw the bread in front of the crowd. Can you imagine, let's say thousands of people, one, low, one, one uh, truck of bread. My sister, she grabbed one loaf, but she says, I never ran as fast as I did in my lifetime because there were people running behind her to want to, wanting to take it away from her. Anyway, she ran when we were, where we were sitting, and when, when she came up to us, we just broke the bread into pieces, and everybody just ate. Because, and then I couldn't eat, so I, I'm a very slow eater, anyway, <laughs> until now. So I took that piece of bread, and I put it behind my coat, so nobody would take it away from me. So they didn't see the bread, they didn't take it away from me. So. Anyway, that was, that, was, uh, that was a very hardship. Uh, we were we were over there, and and then finally, we ended up find, finding out that they're going to separate certain amount of people, and a certain amount of people are going to go into <coughs> labor camps. Certain amount of people are going to go to farm work, and this certain amount of people are going to go for an execution. And found ourselves again in that part of execution. Anyway, we bribed. They bribed some kind of an officer, and they he, he put us into into a group that is going for the labor camp farm. You know, farm. Uh, farm. Tell them uh, how to pay him. Oh, go home. Helm full of gold, full of gold, rings, earrings, uh, uh, medallions, watches, everything that that we had. It was a helmet full of gold. Of course, he, he took us there, and we ended up going to Germany. And uh, that was another another story. We had a, a man that was a very brutal man. He was uh, the farmer, the German the farmer, farmer, the German farmer. Yes, he was. Uh, he had about a hundred people working there. They were Polish, Ukrainian. Most of it, most of them were Ukrainian and Polish. And uh, they used to, Christina and I, we stayed home. We, we did not go to work because what could you do, a little kid like that, they didn't. But uh, my sister Yolanta, she went into the building to work there. It was a building, it was a palace. He had a palace. What was his name? It was Maybrexen, the, the, the town that we're in. Um, I forget his name. Um, from, from somebody. Anyway, he was he was very 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 brutal man. He beat people. He cut the ear off one guy. He knocked one guy's eye out. My sister, poor girl, she worked in that building over there in that palace. And she had to wash the dishes and clean and 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 clean. And uh, one time she, they had to wash their dishes and rinse them with their scorching hot water. It was so hot, and they didn't have any gloves or rubber gloves or nothing. They had to go with their hands. Anyway, uh, so what she did once, she had the plug in the sink. And the hot water was so hot that she couldn't put her hand in, and she put one of the silver cutlery, you know, fork, to open up the cork. And one of the German uh, ladies that was working over there, she, she saw her, and she reported her to the owner. And the owner took her down into the basement, and he beat her. He beat her with. Uh, one of these, uh, how do you call them? It was like a cane, but it was made out of, how do you call that wood that, be, that bends? Bamboo. Bamboo, Bamboo. cane or whatever, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, he bit her, <coughs> beat her so much that not only she was bruised, but she had some bone broken too. And she fell down the stairs, okay, it's about 10 stairs and fell with her face into a 
water. It was a, a, a I don't know what it was. It was like a like a, a how would you call it? It was like a, a deep uh, place in in the in the stones, and they had water there. Sister. It was maybe it was a sister. A gazing pool, maybe. It was a gazing pool. Maybe, like, maybe. Uh, I don't remember very well because we were only there once after the war. We were allowed to go there and see where she was beaten and she fell. And he left her there. She would have died by drowning because her face was right in the water. But she was unconscious when she fell. So, And fortunately enough, there was another worker there. He was hiding behind a corner there when the, when the, when the Bauer left. So he would run to her and picked her up and took her, actually took, to, took her to my mother and us. We we're living in a different different place. We we're living in like a um, barracks. There was, there was hundred of us. So each one of us had different room, different place. And she brought her over to my mother. And uh, fortunately enough, we had one person that knew a little bit of the German law. And uh, he was not allowed to beat us that way. I mean, he, he could uh, incarcerate us, but not beat us to that point. And uh, my mother and another gentleman took her down to the town because it was like it was like a his his uh, farm was a huge big farm he was like an outskirts of the town and his palace of course he, and uh, she took my sister Yolanta to, to town and to the doctor and the doctor looked over my sister and bandaged her up and gave her some medication and uh, afterwards, he took all the information to actually to report him, because he was not allowed to do that. And he was taking all the names and everything in my, and asked my mother her name. And my mother says, Yanina uh, Demek. And he uh, looked at her again. And he said, wouldn't you by any chance write for von Demek with double M? And my mom says, yes, my husband's father used to sign that name back. He says, wouldn't you be the lady that sold me the furniture from your furniture store and factory in Warsaw? My mother says, yes, that's me. God help me. He says, what did, what did they do to you? I says, I'm not the only one. There are millions of us that suffered that much. Millions. Anyway, he did report him. The doctor did report that, that, uh, that uh, I forget his name, my golly. God bless his soul because he's dead. They hung him after the war. They didn't wait for anybody. Only The only time that when Americans came in and we saw the Americans were coming in, they went after him, all the hundred of those workers there. And uh, when they grabbed him and uh, wanted to hang him, the wife came. By the way, my mother, when she was a little girl, 1900s, it was like right now English. It's worldwide known. Everybody almost speaks English now. Before, it used to be French. 1900s, they used to speak French. And well, all the, uh, uh, how do you call it, that, uh, help me, all the uh, Aristocrat. aristocrats and, and, and the higher, higher uh, standing people had to speak French. They had to. If they were, if they were invited into any kind of a, a party or a home or, or whatever was going on to a theater. Everything was spoken in French, even though they were Polish. 
So my mom spoke beautiful in, in French. As a matter of fact, when she was born, she spoke French before she spoke Polish because they had that bona come in to look after the children. You know how rich people are. They have all these people working for them. Anyway. <laughs> and she spoke only French <coughs> to my mother and my uncle, which was three years younger than her. And uh, so when, when uh, going back to that Bauer, that's farmer in, in German. Uh, the wife spoke French, and my mother knew that she spoke French. And when the, she went to this woman, to the wife of, of the man, asking her for some help because she needed some help because we got sick, and she spoke French to her, she said to her in German, Ich spreche nicht Französisch. <laughs> My mother came back to bed. But when the time came to save her husband's life, oh, did she ever speak French? Oh, she came to my mother, she begged her to, to, to save her husband's life. And uh, my mother tried, but nobody would listen. They hung him right in his, in his courtyard. Anyway, uh, but it was a hard time. It was a very, very difficult time. Um, I remember when, oh, as a matter of fact, that was the reason my mother went there. She wanted some soap for her because we were so full of lice that even our clothing were full of lice. You know, in the seams, we used to have the eggs of the lice right inside there. And our head and our, and our bodies and our, my husband never likes me to talk about it because it makes him uneasy. But scratching my head, oh, why not? This is the truth. Scratching my head. head. No, not everybody had my, my problem. <laughs> uh, I scratched my head because it was itchy. So after a while, I used to get scabs. And when the scabs started getting bigger and bigger, the scabs came in to become one big scab. It's like a like the, the hairline, one big scab, like a helmet on top of my head. And in that scab, there were lice right inside of it. And it was itching me terribly. She wanted some soap, so she went there and asked him for soap, and she didn't want to give it to her. So my sister, Christina, still being very slim and skinny, because, you know, food was sparse, she got a little can, and she went in, in the middle of the night into his courtyard there where he had his machinery. And she stole some turpentine, I think. I believe it was turpentine. Not that. Not that, that's turpentine, yeah. And uh, she put that on, on my scab. First she cut my hair off completely, I was hairless. And she, then she put the, the, the turpentine on my head and eventually she killed all the lice and the bugs. And then after a couple of months, the scab used to loosen, and then finally I took it off my head, just like, just like a hat, honestly. I was bald, completely bald, and I cried. I'm not going to have any hair. I'm going to be I'm a girl. I'm not a boy. I want my hair. My mom says, it'll grow back. Don't worry, it'll grow back. But you did. Anyway, uh, it, was, it was tough. We used to get, we used to get from the beginning, we used to get a piece, piece of uh, pork fat like this. So Christina and I, we stayed home, so we had to look after my mother because my mother used to go work, work in the fields. And uh, so she cut this piece of fat into seven pieces. In the winter time was okay because we put it out in a ledge. It would stay nice and firm and everything. But in the summertime it was worse because it was hot, and the flies and the bugs, with the cockroaches and all that, walk, walk around. So it was pretty tough. So we had to put it in a, some kind of a container. But we lived through. My mom used to come back from the field and she'd bring a potato inside her pocket or a beet or or, or some kind of a vegetable, and we used to cook and we used to eat. We lived through. And afterwards, 
my sister and some other guys having all these all these uh, um, workers there and everybody was hungry. We wanted to have some good food, some meat. <laughs> my sister Yolanta and two other guys went and they stole a pig from the Germans. <laughs> you should hear the rackets at night time. My lord, my sister. She carried the pig on her back and in, into the house and then they hid it somewhere. I don't even know where they hid it because I didn't know, no, I, they didn't allow me to go there. But I knew that afterwards we divided that pig amongst all of us and we had meat to eat. It was, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Anyway, then afterwards, afterwards when the Americans came, oh, we were joyous. Oh, we were joyous. It was just absolutely <coughs> I don't know. I don't know how the Iraqis feel right now, but I know how I felt when they came. Believe me, the the fear that you lived with every day, the the hunger, the the the, the uncertainty. It, it was just it was just tragic, really, truly tragic. And uh, when they came, of course, right away, first time in my life I had chewing gum. We did not know what chewing gum was all about. Chocolates, yes, we knew chocolates, yes, because uh, I, in my life, young, youthful life, my father and mom, they used to always bring these things, chocolates and ice cream and bananas and oranges, and it's because they were wealthy and they could afford that. But never a chewing gum. I never saw chewing gum in my, my life. So when I, I chew that sweetness out of it and did not know what to do with it. Swallow it, spit it out. What am I supposed to do with it? So finally I spit it out. <laughs> and uh, then a couple of months, about a month, maybe six weeks later, uh, they packed us up on the trucks and they took us to a, one of these DP camps. They called it Displaced Persons Camp. And from there, they started giving us food. They, you, most of the time, we had soup to go. We used to get these containers and go get our soup and get our rations. And, and that's when I went, first time, that, that's when I went to a classroom. They started teaching the ABCs, and that was 1945. In when did September? When did the war end? You should know Attention, where the war ended. Michael 1945. Quattro, if you're in the building, come the to the main office. But what month? Uh, Michael May, Quattro, May, May, come to the main office. In September. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Anyway. And then we were in these camps, we were transported, the transport the reported from one camp to another, from one camp to another, from one camp to another. And uh, finally, <coughs> you know how it is when you, when you go to school and you get a teacher and he starts teaching you and you, you have him for three, four months and then you are got somebody else in a different school? You can't catch up, you know. Fortunate enough, I don't, I don't say that. I'm a dummy, I couldn't say that, but I'm not the brightest person. I had to study, I had to really study to, to, to know, to, to, to work at it, to be able to memorize it. And uh, it was pretty tough, but I did my grade, didn't finish because we were, I was in grade 11, in grade 11, in, in February, we came to Canada, and the school end, would have ended in June. So I didn't finish my grade 11. That's as much education as I got in Germany in the Polish language. When I came to Canada in 1915, February, that was another story. Do I continue? What happened to me in Canada? Why don't we do this? Um, what's our time frame on the tape? When we came to Canada in 1950, we landed in uh, Halifax. 
um, it was a bad, very bad trip for me because I was sick on the boat. I almost died anyway. But I made it into Canada. And we had to come into Windsor, Ontario, on the train. It was in February when I saw the snow in, in, in Halifax and all the way down, I thought they took me to Siberia. But it was pretty tough. And when we came to Canada here in, in Windsor, the man came in from Kingsville to pick us up and took us to his home. He had an uh, apartment ready for us, which was above, it was above his garage. It wasn't a bad apartment, but it was horrible because the floor had big spaces like this and you can smell the gas and, and the fumes from the car. Anyway, so we lived there and he, my mother worked the house as a housekeeper and Christina and I, we had to uh, go to the greenhouses because February was time to go to greenhouses. Uh, at 4.30 we'd get up, 5 o'clock breakfast, at 5.30 we had to be in the greenhouse. I got very sick, I terribly sick. I got uh, allergy to the cucumbers. I swelled my face, my whole body swelled anyway. He called, called, called the doctor. The doctor came in, gave me some medicine, some cream, charged my mother $25, and the three of us were getting $35 a month for the three of us. He was, I, I don't know, I, I thought we came back. We came to Canada for a better life, but we did not get treated as well. Um, and came August, I was outside on a Sunday. It happened to be my birthday. It was August the 3rd. And a girl from across the street came along. And she says, uh, hi. I says, hi. Very limited English. She says, you know, it's my birthday today. And I said, uh, birthday, birthday, yes. Yeah. She says, today, I'm 15. And she looked at me, I says, today, I'm 15. She says, you're 15? I says, yes. She says, 15 for sure? I says, yes. I took a, a, a stick and I put 15. She says, my goodness, you don't go, you don't go to school? It's our law in Canada. You have to go to school till you're 16. So nobody sent me to school. That's fine. She went and told her mother. Her mother reported him. So come September, I went to school for one year. In this one year, I did grade eights, from first to grade eight. That was enough of my education in Canada, because afterwards we couldn't go anywhere anymore because uh, there was no money. There was no welfare when we came. Nobody gave you any money when we came in 1950. You had to work. If you didn't work, you didn't eat. And if you didn't pay your rent, you're out on the street. So we had to work. So I had to babysit. I had to go clean the houses. I had to go and wash the dishes go to a restaurant in the back, wash the dishes, and we all brought my, my our money and gave it to my mother. My mother got all the money from all our, my Christina, Yolanta, myself, and mama, and we paid our rent, we paid, bought our food. For five dollars, we got enough food to last her for a whole week. Five dollars, Lord, my God. Anyway, uh, and afterwards, uh, my sister got married, Yolanta, uh, then, uh, unfortunately, I got married very young because I was only 17 when I got married. Didn't get no education, nothing. Then my sister Christina got married. We moved into Windsor, Ontario. We lived there for a while. I had one child. Then um, my husband lost his job. And then we had to move to Sudbury. Then I had another child. Then we came back to Windsor. I had enough money to go and uh, pay my bills and pay my ticket, bus ticket to go downtown. I went there. And uh, coming back home from, from the paying the bills, walking five miles, uh, I felt this nudge on my shoulder. I turned around, nobody behind me. 
It was my guardian angel. Careful, you're not gonna finish it. That's all right. So I don't finish. Uh, so that I, you know, and I was walking by, and there was one gate here. I was continuing to go, and I feel another nudge. There's the other gate. So uh, I stopped. I looked around. Nobody behind me. Nobody touching me. I thought, I said, what's going on? I looked over here. It says Ursuline School of Music. Oh. So I went in through this door, came back on the sidewalk, went to the first building, rang the bell, and the nun opens the door for me. Yes, child, what can I do for you? I said, I want to learn how to sing. Oh, she says. So in that case, he says, you have to get Mother St. Ed when she's in charge of the vocal department. I said, okay. So the mother came and she says, I hear you know you want to learn how to sing. I said, yes. She says, um, all right, she says, uh, did you bring any music with you? I says, Oh, I didn't plan on it. And I told her exactly what happened to me with this nudging on my shoulder. So she said, do you know how to sing Schubert's Ave Maria? I said, sister, I know my mother's saying, I heard the music all over. Uh, if you start playing, I'll know if I know it or not. So she sat down and she started playing. I sang for her Schubert's Ave Maria. Same story about the Gounod's Ave Maria. She looked at me and she says, I think I'll take you myself. She taught me, the first two years, I paid for my, paid for my uh, lessons. Thank you. And the rest of it, it's not on the tape, but I want you to listen to it. And then afterwards, then afterwards, it's, it's uh, lessons, 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 two years I paid. And then after two years, she gave me into Kiwanis Festival, this festival, that festival. I got enough money to pay all the rest of my lessons. From then, I went into Toronto. I signed myself into an opera company from there, from uh, opera school. From opera school, I got into Toronto Opera Company. I sang, I sang about 12 operas as diva, as the, the, the soloist. And then afterwards, I got sick. I got rheumatoid arthritis. My last opera was Norma, Bellini's Norma. I was hired to go over there and I couldn't do it because I uh, just couldn't do it anymore. I was limping and so then I stopped. I married him in 1980. He's my second husband because my first husband died because I had cancer. By the way, I had four children with my first husband. And uh, when I married him, I moved to Utica. 1980. I wasn't singing. I wasn't uh, doing anything with my voice. I was in a wheelchair for about nine months with the rheumatoid arthritis. And then afterwards, my girlfriend told me that there is a homeopathic doctor in Canada, about 200 miles or 100 miles out of Toronto, to go to her. She get, got me out of that, out of wheelchair. She got me back walking dancing, singing, and I'm on my way to concertizing. I had a concert at the Monson William in, in Utica last Sunday. Beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful, gorgeous. Even my husband said so. I'm finished, my sweetheart. <laughs> no tape. No tape. How has music been an outlet for you to express all the emotions that you went through during this war? Music. Sweetheart, when, I went, when you are hungry, cold, fearful, you don't think about music. You don't think about it. I never knew that I was going to go into music. I never even, as, except for that time, as I, as I told you. Number one. If I was in Europe, in a situation that I was born into, I would have become probably a big diva, worldwide known. But when I came to Canada, my mother did not have the money. We didn't have money. It only costs money to study. When I got my uh, performers through Western Conservatory of Music, it was on my own. It took me a lot longer. It took me at least, at least 10 years 
to do what people usually do in two or do three. Um, I took piano lessons and I had to get grade six to get my performers. And uh, I worked, as a matter of fact, I told you. Didn't have the education to go and work somewhere, let's say like a secretary or, or a nurse or whatever, making money. I had to go and work as a waitress because that's the only thing I could do with the knowledge that I had, so I did. And I worked nights. <clears throat> Well, already having two children, it was tough. Then about eight years later, I had two more, I had twins. And it was rougher yet. Uh, I used to go to work at 3.30 in the afternoon. Four o'clock I'd start. And um, work till around two. Come home at two o'clock, go to sleep, Get up at six, sit down to my piano, and play till four, till till, till eight. Eight o'clock, I used to go and get my kids off to school, do a little bit of work, this and that, lie down for about an hour in the afternoon and go back to work. And it was like six days a week. Because I worked six days a week instead of five, six. But uh, it, it paid off. Uh, I, I had such a drive afterwards when I started taking those vocal lessons. I had such a drive that I couldn't stop. When I got sick with rheumatoid arthritis and, and I couldn't sing anymore, it attacks your whole body. You know? And you, when you sing, your whole body works from top to bottom. Uh, I couldn't sing. And then when I went to the doctors, to that homeopathic doctor in Canada, as I told you, I started getting out of my sickness. I started humming in the shower. And I started seeing that my voice is coming back. And I started singing much better. Then I had a fight with the Almighty. I said, why did you give me this gorgeous talent? Why did you give me that and you never gave me a chance to become somebody? It was torture. I screamed and I cried and he wasn't home, he went to work, otherwise he would have thought I would went nuts. And uh, then one time, but I always sang in the church, ever since I can remember, we used to have our chapel in camps and used to have choir over there. I always sang in, in a choir, always sang in the choir. There was never any time that I did not sing in. <coughs> and uh, then when, when uh, I had this horrible torture, we were watching this EWN, TWN, mm -hmm. the, the Catholic uh, station with Mother Angelica. And one time a gentleman called and he said that, uh, he was an organist in this church for the past 40 years. And he says, and now a new parish priest came in and he let him go. And, and now he can't play anymore. How could he do that? Mother, please help me. How can he do that? He says, you know, I offered my life playing for God in church. Mother Angelica says, by the way, he says, do you have an organ in your house? He says, yes, I do. So well, your problem is solved. Sit down and play. Don't you think God's going to hear you? Well, that was just like a, I don't know, it was just like a, somebody opened the door for me. It's my Lord, I can sing at home. I can sing for him. So I got one picture of Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the uh, what do you call it? <clears throat> the <clears throat> God of mercy, yeah. And the other one was heart of Jesus. And every time I start singing, I turn around and say, well, you're my best audience. How did you like that? <laughs> and I sing. And uh, it continued. I started singing. Then I went for a treatment to Poland. I went there first year, nine, two, 2000. Because a, a, a gentleman friend that uh, told us that they have a beautiful place to go 
to have treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. And he says, and, and uh, Maria's heart is not too healthy, it's not too strong. He says it would help her if she would get a little bit of relief from the pain, if she would go and, and, and get her heart strengthened. So I went there first year in 2000. And sitting there, of course, I always liked to go to church. I was sitting over there. And the parish priest came out and he said that uh, to the whole congregation, he says, you know, tomorrow is the most beautiful day that God has, Christ has left us. It's Corpus Christi. And in Poland, in Italy, in most of the European countries, they have a, a beautiful celebration on these days. They have a procession going through the streets. And uh, the girls go in white gowns and, and boys with their suits and they go get the flowers in the basket and, and they throw flowers in front of priest that comes out with the monstrance and goes right through the whole town or city or wherever they are. And I'm sitting over there and the priest saying, says, we have to beautify this day. We have to beautify it. Make as gorgeous as we can possibly do. And I hear this What's going on? Turn around, nobody. And here's the voice coming through me, and he said, Maria, you can help. You can beautify this day. Why don't you go and sing? So I'm sitting over there. I'm very shy as far as my own personal, personal being is concerned. I can do wonders for others. But it's very difficult for me to, to go and ask for myself. And then I hear this voice, why don't you move your buttocks and get going? my guardian angel using a bad language. <laughs> anyway, I went to that organist and I said, excuse me, sir, but do you think that Father, since he was inviting everybody to make beautify this day tomorrow, could I sing tomorrow in church? His face kind of fearful. Oh, my Lord. Many people, and I know the feeling, many people come up and they say they sing. Well, unfortunately, some of them open their mouth and they yell, they don't sing. So he was scared of that. And uh, I said, I, I don't, didn't mean to scare you like this, but I did take vocal lessons. I did sing in opera for about 18 years. Oh, he says, oh, I see. Would you bring any music with you? I says, I'm sorry, I came here for treatments of my rheumatoid arthritis. I didn't come here to concertize. Don't you have any music here in church? So he says, well, wait a minute. So he went down, comes back comes out, guess what? Schubert's out of Maria. Okay, so I sat down, he was saying, and afterwards he said, I'll get the priest to, uh, to talk to him. I said, okay, come back tomorrow at 9.30. Not here, but to the chapel, that's where the, where the, per the procession starts. So I went there, and uh, they started, I started singing, and the parish priest didn't hear me before, came out from the back, came to the front and looked at me. And he says, good Lord, you send an angel with an angel voice. Where are you from? I says, United States. Come and see me afterwards. Come and see me afterwards. So I did that evening. I went down to his, his place over there and I talked. And he said, are you planning on coming back next year? I says, yes, I do. He says, um, well, would you mind giving us a concert here in church? Because we're starting, started building a church, and we're trying to get as much money to put into it as possible. I says, why not? Of course. He says, send all the music you want to our organist, and he'll work on it. And when you come back next year, we'll put in a, a concert. So I did. The next year, I following year, I went back there. We put all the music together. We did the concert right in church. And fortunately for me, he taped it and made a disc out of it. Did he enjoy your disc? I love our disc. And, and believe it or not, all the money they collected in church, the church was filled to capacity. They collected quite a few hundreds of, the, of, of uh, zwati. I sold about $970 uh, zwati uh, worth of CDs. 
and uh, I sent four hundred dollars here because I brought some with me and I was selling them, and I collected the money and I sent it in, and uh, I got the CD. I could never afford it before. See, United States and Canada, it's very expensive to do these things. And I could never get enough money. Either it was kids, either this was going to university, this one going to Swiss, this one going here, this one. I was left alone for a few few years because my first husband passed away with cancer. So, you know, it was just tough, rough. But, uh, but uh, uh, I did it. I have it. And I'm very grateful, and I'm very happy to be here. I love America. You can sing a song. I did it my way. I did it my way. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still here. So there was a reason for why I stayed around. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it gave you something, some kind of an inkling. Don't let this country go down. Watch, because you have to you have to bring up our country back up where it's supposed have, to be. You have beautiful Decent country. life, Don't nice people. We have a final question. 